Hello, beloved saints and sons and daughters of the Almighty. Thank you so much for listening. Today we are doing Torah portion, Archimat, which means after death. And this was the um, after Nadab and Abihu passed away. They got burnt up in the um, tabernacle because they brought profane fire into the tabernacle, which... Um, they're only supposed to get fire from the altar. The altar is cleansed daily with blood of the offerings, the sacrifices. And um, so this altar is holy and the fire on this altar is holy because of this constant cleansing, continual cleansing of the altar. And so they brought fire from outside, which they weren't supposed to do. And... Um, if you listen to my last week's Torah portion, basically, I um, I believe they were cursed because of the sin of Aaron officiating the golden calf. The sins of the parents go to their, their, their children. This happened to David. This happened to um, Ham's son, the, the uh, Canaan. It happened also to Ahab's sons. And... Um, I believe it happened to them. They were, they, for some reason, they were cursed and they weren't taught the proper protocol of where to get the fire. They would only get the, get the fire from off the altar because it is holy and sanctified and set apart and consecrated for fire inside the temple use. No fire from outside, no common fire uh, from outside was allowed in the tabernacle. And they might have been drinking beforehand because right after this happened, there's a command not to drink alcohol and go in the tabernacle. So some suggest that that might be uh, also happening there. They might have drank an alcohol. But that is just a theory based on Scripture, but it's not backed by Scripture. So, um, and then also, yeah, so the curse. The curses are really the main thing. And then they didn't, they weren't um, taught the rules properly. And so this is why uh, they got burnt up. And it's a sad, sad, sad thing. But um don't commit idolatry. That's the uh, whole point behind that. Uh, Aaron had officiated the golden calf. Everybody else died, but he, but he didn't. Okay, so anyways, this, uh, this Day of Atonement and the consecration of the priests uh, happened, uh, I believe, on the first seven days. They slept in the tabernacle, and they slept at the door of the tabernacle. And um, it also happened I, uh, on the seventh month. Um, and so they were consecrating and dedicating, dedicating themselves to Yahweh. This was a threshold covenant. I talked about the threshold covenant last last uh, month, but uh, our last Torah portion. Uh, it was a threshold covenant. So they were dedicating to Yah as priests and slept at the door of the tabernacle. It is also when I believe that Yah officially marries Israel um, in Numbers 8. So all these events... Um, Happened Leviticus 9, 10, Numbers 8, and this Torah portion is all about this one day of atonement event when they had just finished building the tabernacle. And um, this is where Yah dwells, and the priests are, are like the bride, they're wearing all white. What do the, the priests do? They cook for their husband, they make food for him uh, symbolically. I don't believe that he eats it, I think he just smells the aroma. Uh, I believe that he is a vegetarian or a vegan, <laughs> based on my studies. But um, he might not eat at all. Who knows? Uh, but I, I believe that he might. Um, he does certainly smell things, and uh, he does other things. So um, he doesn't have to eat, of course. He's uh, eternal. Um, but if he does eat, if he did, I think he would be a vegan or vegetarian, because I don't think he's going to eat his own creations like he created a lamb. I just don't see him eating a lamb chop. I just don't see it. And it, it's not his way he does things. But anyway, uh, let me go back to this here. Uh, so, uh, Yah officially marries Israel on Numbers 8 on Day of Atonement. And this was uh, this is right before this happens, right? And, um, and uh, last week's Torah portion was the eighth day, Shemini. And so this, I believe, is the ninth day right before Day of Atonement. And so um, I'm going to speak about Day of Atonement, some stuff about Day of Atonement. So uh, the story of Joseph is a Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Kippur event and most likely happened on Yom 
Kippur, possibly, or really close to it, and is a parallel of this day's, this day's sacrifice. Joseph represents the goat who was sent into exile. See, one goat is sent into exile and takes the sins of the, of the nation, and the other goat, the innocent goat, is killed um, to cleanse the tabernacle. And so, um, yeah, um, so this event happens with Joseph. Um, Joseph represents the goat that was exiled, was sent into exile. So just as one innocent goat takes all the sins of the nations of Israel and is sent out of the camp, so did Joseph, who was an innocent, who was innocent and bore the horrible sins of their brother, all the brothers, and was sent into exile when they sold him as a slave. And just as the other goat is sacrificed on the Day of Atonement and the blood is thrown on the altar to cleanse it, so does the brother sacrifice a goat to cover their sin. And that represents the other goat that is sacrificed on Yom Kippur. And then they, they too sacrificed a goat and threw goat's blood on Joseph's coat of many colors to try to make atonement for this wicked sin. This coat was a priestly coat, as Joseph, being the oldest son of Rachel, was to be the priest of the family. And so when they put blood on this priestly coat, it was just like when the priests do the sacrifices and get blood upon their linen tunics. And when they, they told their father that Joseph had been eaten, the brothers thought by placing this goat's blood on this coat that they would bring their father Jacob closer to loving them more. It didn't happen though. But just like when the high priest did these sacrifices and the blood would get on their garments, this act brought Yah, their father, closer to them. So it did work for that, but it didn't work for, for those the brothers. One goat was killed and sacrificed in the story of Joseph to use to put blood on the coat of many colors, and the other innocent goat, Joseph, was banished into exile. Then the exiled goat Joseph comes back to save his brothers and family and become the second most powerful person in the world. So it's very messianic of Yeshua, right? He's going to come back and save his, his brothers, all of us. And he's the second most powerful person in the universe right now. So um, I just find it fascinating that uh, they did the same thing here. They uh, one goat is sacrificed, and one goat Joseph is sent away. So it's it's like a Yom Kippur event, and and uh, they put blood on the the garment. The garment is called Kethoneth. If you look it up, it's Kethoneth, and it's all, always refers to a priestly or kingly um, position, and uh, it, it, it's for uh, Yas um, original Melchizedek. Melchizedek priesthood, which was a, a king of righteousness. So he's a king uh, and he's a priest, right? He's a king and priest, king of righteousness. And so um, this coat was, Jacob was supposed to be the king of righteousness, the Melchizedek priest of the family, but uh, instead they sold him away. And um, sadly, he, uh, he didn't get to wear that coat until later he got to wear it. He got to wear it, and he saved all his brothers, which is good. So Yeshua, who was also betrayed by his brothers and exiled into uh, death and had blood on his robe, will also come back to save his brothers on the second coming and save the world. And many will not recognize him, just like they didn't recognize Joseph, but he was the true ruler, and he was their brother. And uh, I don't think many people will recognize Yeshua when he comes back because the religion will be so far off by then. And he too will save all of Judah and Israel from the great tribulation and famine that is to come. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now here's another <laughs> Yom Kippur event which I thought was really cool. And it, it, it involves Jacob and Esau. A similar incident happens with Jacob and Esau. Esau was supposed to be the priest of the family, but denied Yah by not taking this role and sinning greatly. And he allowed, uh, he sold his priestly position for a bowl of lentils, which was horrible. And so when one person sins in the family, it affects everyone. So Jacob steps up 
and takes the role of the priest. In the process, he also takes and bears the sin of Esau on him and is exiled out of the promised land. And just like the goat who was sent out of the camp, Jacob actually puts on goat skins so that Isaac would have thought it was a hairy, his son, hairy son um, Esau. So not only is Jacob filling the role of this exiled goat, but he is also dressed up in goat skins as well. So he is actually fulfilling this Yom Kippur event perfectly before being sent away. Also, Rebecca tells Jacob to go get two goats from the flock so she can make a savory meal for Isaac. And when she kills the one goat for this meal, this is symbolic of the sacrificed goat that's done on the Day of Atonement. And when Jacob, who wore goat skins and ran away, he is the goat that is set free in the wilderness to take away the sins from the camp. So again, we have another Yom Kippur event happening over 3,500 years ago. I thought that was really cool. That one actually I like better than the Joseph one for some reason. Uh, but I do like the Joseph one too because it's tied in with Day of Atonement as well. Okay, so uh, because of the sending away of the goat with the sins, it keeps the camp clean. So it's a picture of what we need to do. We need to take all of our sins and send them out of the camp today. So what sins do you have? You need to get rid of and send out to the camp. Send out of the out of the camp. We need to work on that. Ask the Father. Pray for that. Okay. So there are there are on Day of Atonement, there's a lot of sacrifices done. So I'm just going to summarize real quick. In Leviticus 16, 6. Aaron shall offer a bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. So uh, when a priest sins, he's at a higher calling. So he's got to offer up a bull. And the bull is like a thousand dollars. So he had to give up a thousand, basically a thousand dollars. And uh, Leviticus sixteen fifteen, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring the blood within the veil and do what is the blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and uh, before the mercy seat. Um, I'm going to talk about this mercy seat. That's really not the name of it. I'll give you the name a little bit later here, but. Um, it's really called the lid of atonement. There is no mercy seat. That word is not in there. It's not a seat and it's not mercy. It's a lid of atonement. But um, we can just say mercy seat so everyone knows what we're talking about. But uh, that word is never used in the Old uh, in the Old Testament. Okay, so let's read uh, verse 16. And so the innocent goat, this isn't the verse, but it's it's referring to verse 16 the other innocent goat is slaughtered to make atonement for the defiled temple because of the sins of the people that was Yeshua so this first goat makes atonement for the defiled temple so this is really cool here because uh, the, t the temple has been defiled and they cleanse it they're able to cleanse it with this one innocent goat who's slaughtered and this is what Yeshua did Yeshua died and makes atonement for the defiled temple but not the, he didn't make uh, he didn't make atonement for the physical tabernacle, the temple in um, in um, on the earth, but he did it in the heavenlies. So this is a big deal right here, and I'm going to read you the verse that verifies this. So basically, Adam was in the presence of Yahweh, and he sinned before Yahweh, so he defiled the heavenly tabernacle, and this separated man from Yahweh. He could, they could no longer dwell together because Yah is holy in Kodesh and man was, is flawed. We are all in the same position Adam is. We're in the image of Adam right now, it says in uh, Genesis 5. We are subject to aging and death. We are in our physical form. We're not in a spiritual form. Adam and Eve were in our, their spiritual bodies and they lost that. They, they, they were going to have eternal life forever. They had spiritual bodies. They lost that spiritual body. That's how they knew they were naked. And so they they now are, they're, are, I'm sorry, they were in the physical. And so they could die. They were subject to aging and death. And so are we. We're subject to aging and death. And we're in our physical form. We're not in our eternal bo bodies. We need to gain those back. So Yeshua was able to open up that door again. He cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. So he his death, he's like the day of atonement sacrifice here that cleanses the tabernacle but he cleanses 
the heavenly tabernacle, not the earthly. And let me give you the verse to back this up. So anyone who um, wants to look it up, it's in Hebrews 9, verse 23. And it says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified for these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice, it's referring to Yeshua, than these. For Messiah did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in Yah's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. So right here, he offered himself to cleanse the heavenly tabernacle. This is exactly what's being said here. And I'm going to read it one more time so you can really, I'm going to accentuate the words that really point this out. It was necessary, okay, this is uh, Hebrews 9.23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Messiah did not enter the sanctuary made with human hands. That was a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, not to appear for us in Yah's presence, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. He did it once, one time. So he offered himself one time and cleansed the heavenly tabernacles. There was nobody, it says in Revelation, um, Yahweh's holding a scroll. And no, it says nobody was found worthy to take the scroll, but only Yeshua. Why was Yeshua the only one worthy? Because he was the only man who was sinless, who was willing to give up his life and take the punishment of his bride. We are all the bride. Everyone deserves death, right? And so he took that punishment, and so he cleansed the heavenly tabernacles. He's the only one worthy on the whole universe, right, to do this. And so uh, he cleansed the heavenly this This amazing act of kindness from a pure man uh, cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. Nothing else cleansed it. So this allow us uh, the opportunity to dwell with Yah again. So this is amazing. And it ties in with Day of Atonement. It's a beautiful picture of Day of Atonement in Hebrews 4.9. So I, re I really like it. And um, it's a it's 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 a great it's a great uh, tie-in. But let's I'm gonna stop on that, and I'm just gonna continue on with the sacrifices for Day of Atonement. Okay, so Leviticus sixteen sixteen, he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions, even all their sins. So he shall do the tent he sh so he shall do the tent of meeting that dwells with them in the middle of their uncleanness. So uh, the tent of meeting is cleansed on the Day of Atonement. And this is what Yeshua did, but he did the heavenly tent of meeting. Okay. Leviticus 16.33 Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar. For he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. So Everything's getting atoned for here. Everything. And uh, verse 22. Uh, the other goat takes the sin of the people and it is sent out of the camp and cut off. So um, Leviticus 16, 21. Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, even of all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and he shall send them away into the, the wilderness by the hand of the man who is in readiness. It doesn't say they were cut off. So uh, I scratched that out. Uh, it does, the, the goat is not cut off. So um, I just uh, misspoke there. So anyways, um, what is this all a picture of, right? Let me finish them. Leviticus 16.22 The goat shall carry all the iniquities on himself to a solitary land, and, to, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So this goat um, was sent away. It took all the sins out of the out of the camp. So Day of Atonement was the clean, cleanest the tabernacle ever was all year. It was the cleanest the people were all year, and the people, everybody, fasted and prayed and and um, repented of their sins. This is what you do on a 
on Day of Atonement. So what better day to get married to your bride when your house is clean, your people are clean, and um, and all the sin is taken away from the, the camp. It, this is when they got married in Numbers 8. And I have a whole video on it. It's called the Feast of Yahweh. Uh, and it all ties to wedding rehearsal and a wedding memorial. And um, it's a pretty short video. I think it's 20 minutes maybe or something. But it, it explains it in mo much more detail if you want to watch that. And so, um, yeah. So this whole thing is an amazing picture of what Yeshua has done for us and cleansing um, cleansing everything all of us uh, what what does this exile goat represent and what is this uh, one the goat that dies what what else does this symbolically represent well um, it's basically um, it's a picture of Israel and Judah really Judah deserves to die before because of their sins I mean before they were taken over by Babylon, they were doing, uh, they weren't keeping the land Sabbath, the Shemitah. They weren't um, keeping, uh, you know, they were doing idolatry. They were doing divination. They were oppressing the widows, the orphans, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned. The, the, you know, they were oppressing them. So that's like a double sin. Not only were they not helping them, but they were, they were oppressing them. And um, also, they were. Um, um, Ch sacrificing children to Moloch, which is horrible. So uh, they were extremely wicked, and so um, they all deserve to die. And Judah uh, deserves to die, but Yeshua, which came out of the tribe of Judah, dies for Judah and Israel and everybody on earth. So this is a beautiful picture of that. So he actually was the innocent goat that was killed and covered the sin. And the northern kingdom of Israel... Now they never. I don't believe they ever sacrificed children uh, <clears throat> to Moloch or anything like that. But they they were pretty wicked as well. I mean, all throughout their whole, they committed idolatry, heavy idolatry, and so they also deserved um, um, to be uh, killed. But they were actually given a second chance, um, and they were sent um, out of the camp. They were overtaken by Assyria, and they were never brought back. And so this is a picture of them. So Yah actually divorced Israel because that's how he, he was upset with them because of their idolatry. Uh, now, he only saved Judah because of the promise to David. If you notice, it's mostly the nobility that are saved, which is um, King David's line of, of, it's, uh, of all the Jewish people. There was some, um, when Babylon came, they left some of the farmers there, so the meek farmers were saved and some were scattered through the uh, earth and then most of them were, were killed and then he took the nobility king david's line and sent them to babylon they were actually saved and got to uh you know regenerate david's line of uh, uh royalty royal family so uh many jewish people today that are still alive uh today are probably relatives of king david most likely um, because of this. So it was only because of King David, because of this uh, killing of children. Yah hates that. And, uh, all throughout scripture, he utterly hates that. When when Pharaoh did it, he brought up Moses to destroy them. And they all died. he brought all the whole army into the river and destroyed them in the water, just like they destroyed the, water, the babies in the water. When Herod did it, he destroyed all of Judah because of what Herod did in 70 A.D., and they were utterly destroyed in, in 72 or 74 AD, I believe, uh, because of this wickedness. And uh, abortion today, it's the same thing. Um, it, there's going to be a wrath for that. There is going to be a punishment. So, it, it, you know, those who pray for the abortions to stop in America, that's, a, that's, that, that's what Yah wants. He wants, Amer he wants abortions to stop in America. In the whole world, he wants it to stop. It's it's a horrendous sin. It's uh, he hates the shedding of innocent blood. It's one of the six things he hates, and especially babies. That's really innocent blood, right? And so, um, it's important to to do something to help uh, stop abortion. This is one of the main things that we uh, should be trying to do peacefully, of course, right? 
So at the very least, we should be praying for these abortion clinics to be shut down. Um, many people pay, pray in front of the abortion clinics. Many people, um, you know, call the landlord and, and uh, try to, uh, you know, um, you know, try to tell them not to rent to these people. Um, and, you know, they, you know, any way that you can try to stop an abortion peacefully is highly recommended uh, because um, it's murder. It's basically genocide. It's genocide. Um, and it shouldn't be allowed anywhere. It's against Yah's law. And these poor people that work there have been brainwashed. Uh, these poor women who work there and they have no idea that the founder of Planned Parenthood was a racist and they only set up um, they only set up shop in ethnic neighborhoods. So they're really all about ethnic cleansing is what they're all about. Uh, they're, they're, um, if you look at all the Planned Parenthoods, it's only in ethnic neighborhoods. So um, they're, they have a racist agenda, which is evil already. And then they also, on top of that, they're killing innocent children. So um, yes, uh, I've seen many places get shut down. Just by people praying in front of the building, and some people using megaphones, speaking, uh, preaching the word. Uh, I saw uh, the two places get shut down just from people uh, being out there. And so, you know, uh, try to get some signs that say uh, adoption, not abortion, you know, anything. Uh, you know, we want to do it in a nice, kind way. We don't want to do it in a, in, a, in a mean way or a bad way because these people don't even know. They've been so deceived by the world. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know they're they're like Ninevites. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. So they're they're is just as innocent, and they need to be, they need to know that it's wrong, and they need to accept that. Uh, but we do it in in a nice way. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Anyways, let me go back to uh, to what we were talking about here. So yeah, so Judah deserves to die, but Yeshua took the punishment for Judah. Right, because he comes from the line of Judah, and also he died for northern Israel, and he's going to come back and gather northern Israel, who's been scattered to the four corners of the earth. It says, so uh, Isaiah 11 says they've been scattered to the four, and, and he's going to bring those, that wild, that goat, and so this goat that gets uh, kicked out of the uh, the um, gets kicked out of the camp actually gets to come back, right? It gets to come back, and, and so the, this goat gets a second chance. The scapegoat even gets a second chance. Yeshua was killed and he was brought back to life. So uh, Yah is the almighty of second chances. So if you've messed up and you've sinned, well, guess what? You get a second chance with Yahweh. And he, he gives you a second chance. Now, it's kind of like baseball. I don't know if he's going to give you a third chance. But he'll definitely give you a second chance. And he's all uh, he's all about that. And uh, I believe he does give us third chances in fourth and fifth and sixth. And he works with us, right? He's not about perfection. He's about growth and he's about overcomers. He's looking for people that will overcome, right? Maybe take it might take two months. It might take a year. But it, if you overcome your sin, then you're that you're you're on your side, right? And if you're battling and you're struggling and you're making headway here and there, and that's what all that's really what counts. That's what Yah is looking for. Okay. So um, all right. So what does this other goat uh, represent? Also. Uh, the goat that is exiled represents Adam, who was exiled out of the promised land and out of, you know, Yah's Garden of Eden, basically, uh, which is Yah's throne area on earth. And, and um, the second goat represents Yeshua, who was killed and took away the sins of the whole world and cleansed the heavenly tabernacle, as we see in Hebrews 9. Um, and so we, he allowed what Adam defiled, Yeshua cleansed and sanctified. And so now we can go back and we're going back. To, we get to the opportunity to dwell with Yahweh again. And um, what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, picture. Now, this uh, this Day of Atonement is not a one-time event. It's a lasting ordinance forever, it says in Leviticus 16.29. It is forever. So we're going to be doing this in the kingdom. We're going to be doing it in the millennium. We're always going to be keeping Day of Atonement. It's going to be a beautiful day of fasting and cleansing yourself to become closer to Yahweh. And um, it's just beautiful. The whole thing is beautiful. Okay. So let's go on to the next point. Why does the high priest take off the outer garments before going into the Holy of Holies? Um, so he's just wearing the white tunic, right? When he goes in. 
they have this elaborate garment that they wear and it's got all these beautiful colors on it and it's got um, all this uh, nice beautiful gemstones and the 12 gemstones representing the 12 tribes and it's got gold in it and well he takes all that off and the, the reason why is um, he wants he wants us to to shed all of our you know exterior you know um, you know, you, you, you might have an exalted position on earth, but you're just a mere human in the very presence of the Almighty. And so he wants us to, to be humble servants in his presence and, and not to be exalted in any way before him. He should be exalted. And um, so this is, this is what I believe why he, they take their uh, garments off. But he should, this person should be exalted in the eyes of other men because he is very, he's supposed to be very set apart, very holy and very Kodesh. So this is why he uh, wears these garments. And so he's going to be set apart. and um, But not for his own glory, for Yahweh's glory, right? So he's wearing this elaborate outfit to give Yah glory. And to say, hey, listen, I have to be I have to be at a higher calling than the other priests. And a higher calling than the, the Israelites. And a higher calling than the world, the pagans. You know, you, so it's, it's, it's just a reminder, really, of who, who we serve and who we should be acting like. And that's why the priests wear their all white. And white is a symbol of purity. And so the priests are to be to be holy. Uh, okay. So in this one, I okay, this one I really like this one. <laughs> this one's cool. Uh, okay, so it says not to marry your sister. You cannot marry your sister, obviously, right? Well, what about Abraham? He said he married his sister. Well, um, this is what Isaac said too. Isaac was uh, when he was speaking with Abimelech, he said, "This is my sister." Well, we all know that it was his cousin. Rebecca was his cousin, right? Uh, he they weren't even they weren't blood they weren't they weren't brother and sister at all, because uh, we know how many kids uh, Abraham had, and Rebecca was not one of them. So he definitely wasn't his sister. So this word "sister" is called akuth, a c o t h, and it means relative right and um i did a whole study on this and um in torah portion um what was it i don't know genesis 20 whatever torah portion that is and uh it tells it in more detail but basically it means relative so this word sister means relative. this is my relative when well, it's true it is his relative but it's actually his cousin which you're allowed to marry your cousin so um, it's kind of weird nowadays. Nobody really marries their cousin anymore, but uh, it is legal. Uh, technically, according to the Bible, you can marry your cousin if you wanted to, and it wouldn't be illegal in any way, and it wouldn't be wrong. Um, just modern day society, we, we normally don't do that, but it, it is totally legal. And Abraham did it, I believe, and also Isaac did it, and so um, and so can you if you wanted to. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this is what this is the, Abraham. Of course, he's one of the most righteous people who ever walked the face of the earth. No sin is recorded on him except for this one sin where he denies his wife and says it's his sister, which was uh, a lie. Um, and it's it really points to Yeshua. Really, I mean, uh, think about it. Abraham didn't stand up for his wife. He should have said, "This is my wife," and he didn't. And then Isaac did the same thing with Abimelech. This is not, this is not, he said, this is my relative. It's not my wife. And so it's, and then, um, so it's a picture of Yeshua, who was the first man to willingly uh, st stand up for his wife and uh, protect his wife and uh, actually took the punishment for her. And Adam didn't do this. Eve ate of the Garden of Eden. And he should have said, no, you shouldn't have done that. And he should have told Yahweh, please don't punish her. I'll take the punishment for her. And he didn't. He didn't. So uh, we finally have Yeshua who's willing to take the punishment for his bride. And so uh, this is really what it, this all points to. Again, everything points to Yeshua. I mean, the whole scriptures. But yes. Um, he's looking for men that are willing to not only be righteous like Abraham and Isaac were extremely righteous, but also to willingly give up your life for your bride. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? This is the kind of person that Yah is looking for and uh, to not sin and to be willing to uh, give up your life for her. 
Okay, so um, the other thing, the other question is, how did Adam and Eve's children have children without marrying their sister? Okay, so I definitely believe all the commandments were in place before, um, you know, in the beginning. In the beginning, all the commandments were there, right? Because even Noah knew what were clean animals. He was supposed to put seven in the clean animals and and two uh, pairs of the unclean animals on. Genesis 25, it talks about, or 26, I think, uh, Abraham kept all the commandments and statutes and ordinances. And um, I won't get into it. I, I'm going to make a video on it. But, I mean, all the commandments were in place. He blessed the Sabbath day in Genesis 2 and made it holy. So that day was already blessed and made holy. So, I mean, the commandments, were they weren't given at Mount Sinai. They were re-given at Mount Sinai, right? They were given again, right? And so, um, back before they had writing, they would um, teach the commandments to their children verbally, right? And this is how they would keep the commandments. And so, all the commandments were in place. And if you think about it, Genesis is just a retelling of the events that happened. And then Exodus is actually, um, um, you know, it's like a play-by-play, -play, uh, live telling of what's going on. Um, and uh, Genesis is a retelling that Yahweh, I believe, told Moses. And so he's rewriting that. And um, in, in Exodus 20, I mean, it's the second book of the Bible, it talks about the commandments. So uh, really... The commandments were given at the beginning of time, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that right now. But, but uh, so uh, Adam and Eve's children, how could they marry uh, and not break this commandment of marrying their sister? This has been a, a, like a mystery for me for a long time. I'm like, well, Yod would not allow his children to sin after he makes this command. It's very clear you're not to marry your sister, but you can marry your cousin. So how did Adam and Eve's children have children and Eve still be the mother of all. So it says that uh, Eve is the mother of all. So this one was perplexing to me. And so I prayed and I and I prayed about this. And this is what I came up with. And it's just a theory, but it's based on scripture, not backed by scripture. Okay. So backed by scripture means the scripture backs it up what I'm saying. But based on scripture means something that happened in scripture that could possibly happen again. So it's based on scripture. So I believe that Yahweh took a rib from each one of Adam's sons and made a wife for each one of the sons. And it makes total sense to me because he did it originally with Adam and Eve, right? Why wouldn't he do it with them? So that way they're not marrying their sister and they can still be uh, from Eve. They're all from Eve still. Eve is the mother of all. So it answers the question totally. And it fits in with scripture what happened in the past. Now, it's a theory I just want to say, but it really answers the question. And it's in, I think, I think this is what happened. I really do. I think that uh, Yahweh did this because it's how else can you solve the per, uh, how else can Eve be the mother of all? And how else can they not marry their sister? It has to be this, right? Because it comes out of the rib of the man. So each one of Adam's sons, he made another, he took a rib out and made another wife. And then it answers both questions. They don't marry their sister and Eve is still the mother of all. So it's perfect. I mean, it's, and, and it's something that scripturally they did in the past, right? Yahweh did this in the past. So it just makes total sense to me. Um, it's a beautiful theory and praise Yahweh. I, I hope it's right, but we, we won't know for sure until we get to the kingdom. It's, it's it's a fun one. I like it. Okay. All right. So, why do the priests wear eat frankincense on the bread, on the grain offerings? And why do they wear linen? Um, okay. So, you know, we, we didn't really know that vitamins were good f for us. You know, vitamin C, of course, we know it helps with uh, congestion of the chest and colds and stuff like that. We didn't know this, right? We didn't know that you could eat, eat a bunch of oranges and help your cold get better. And, um, but um, that was like a hundred, I think 120 years ago. We didn't really understand it until about that time. It really started coming into. So I, I believe it's the same thing with frequency. Everything on earth has a frequency, 
right? Everything puts off a certain level of, of uh, megahertz frequency, frequency. You can measure it and see that everything has an energy and a, and a frequency. The average person has a frequency of 58. That's a healthy person. A cancer patients have a frequency of 27 megahertz. Frankincense has a very high frequency of 147. It's one of the highest frequency foods uh, that are consumable um, on earth. I think um, wheatgrass is 300 megahertz frequency, which is really high and extremely healing for people. Um, so there's a theory that this higher frequencies help you uh, live a healthier and, and better life. And they say that bad thoughts, you can, if you have bad thoughts, it will lower your frequency of your, of yourself 10 to 15 megahertz. If you have good thoughts, um, this raises your megahertz frequency 10 megahertz. And so uh, eating processed foods and meats and dairies have a frequency of zero megahertz to three megahertz. And that's the same with canned food, very low megahertz. But if you're eating fruits and vegetables and um, almonds and raw cacao, this has a frequency of 50 megahertz. Um, herbs are very high. They have 52 megahertz. Wheatgrass is 300. So um, by eating this frankincense, they would put it on the bread. They were raising their frequency of their body. I, I, theoretically here, what we're talking about. And linen has a frequency of 5,000. In fact, linen was so good that they would use it in hospital bed sheets because they would lower the frequency, they would lower the time, they would lower the amount of bed sores on people because this linen was really healing and wool has a frequency of 5,000 as well and it's very healing um, as the theory goes. So um, this is why I believe Yahweh knows this. He, he, he knows this and, and there's a lot of different studies on this, but um, so he wanted his priests to live a long life, and he and this was part of the part of the reason why they would eat uh, the uh, frankincense because they ate a lot of meat, which is very uh, low frequency. So that so I think it would counter the effect of the eat the meat that they ate, and so that they wouldn't die younger. They would live a longer life. And most holy people, uh, it's one of the promises in Scripture. If you honor your mother and father, your days will be long on the earth. If you keep the commandments, your days will be long on the earth, and things will go well with you, it says, when we honor our mother and father. So it's super important to do these things. Um, but yeah, the frequency is very interesting. It's an interesting study. Um, but I don't want to get too much into that because uh, I want to get back to the Torah here. Okay, I just want to read this one verse. I, I think it's really cool. It uh, talks about uh, I, um, Yeshua, how he's going to wear this Kethoneth coat again. This Kethoneth coat, if you look at the Strong's word for this. In Isaiah twenty-two twenty-one, 21, Yeshua will uh, wear this same priestly coat of authority as we see in Isaiah 22. And he's going to wear it under the order of Melchizedek. So he's going to be a king and a priest. So he's going to be wearing this Kethaneth coat, there's, and he's going to be the king of the earth, and he's going to be a priest. And, and it says, I will, uh, Isaiah 22, 21, And I will clothe him with a robe, and strengthen him with the girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father of, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And it says, uh, and that word robe is Kethaneth. And so I thought that was pretty fascinating that, uh, you know, there's many people who wore this coat in Scripture. If you look up the, the Strong's word, Kethoneth, um, Adam wore this Kethoneth coat. He was a priest of Yahweh. Um, Job wore it. And I believe Job was the one who Abraham gave a tithe to. Because Job lived a, li a little bit longer, about 40 more years than Abraham did. So... He must have been older than Abraham uh, because the, the ages seemed to decrease. And then um, Jacob wore, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, wait, was Jacob? Joseph had this coat of many colors. Um, I believe Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob were all, it doesn't say in scripture. Um, King David wore 
this cat that uh, our okay name Tamar wore this Ketherneth coat. It says in scripture. Um, who else? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, Solomon had this Ketherneth coat. Um, Tamar uh, Tamar was uh, uh, King David's daughter. Um, I can't remember off. I got a whole video on it anyway, but. Uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty fascinating. Priest and king. All right, let me let me go to the next topic actually. Okay, so in Leviticus 18:24 says, "If you continue in these disgusting practices, uh, the land will vomit you up." Right? In Leviticus 18:24 through 27. So, he's basically saying, "Don't do as the pagans do and don't do anything disgusting or the land will vomit you up." Well, there is a city in Rome near Rome called Pompeii. And uh, they were extremely uh, opulent and looked, they had lived a luxurious lifestyle and they had many brothels and there was sexual immorality there. It was a resort town and many Jewish slaves had moved there. And um, this town uh, in 79 AD was completely destroyed because of its sexual immorality, I believe. Um, it said because... Uh, this Mount Vesuvius, this volcano, I believe, vomited up this lava and burnt up the city in one hour. It was completely burnt up. And um, they weren't even expecting it, but the land vomited them out. <laughs> it totally, the, the volcano vomited all the lava all over them and killed them all. And so, um, it's true. Yahweh does not lie. He does not lie. He is... Uh, he speaks the truth, um, literally. Okay, so all slaughter offerings, according in chapter 17, must be done at the temple and brought to the temple. And no offerings were to be done within your gates. So he didn't want people doing sacrifices and offerings in their own gates. They had to do them at the Levites were the only ones allowed to do it at the temple. So this was the ordinance. Now, if you had food to eat in Deuteronomy 12, 15, if you had food to eat, you could uh, uh, kill it within your gates and eat it there. And your tithe, uh, if you had a tithe, you had to go to Jerusalem where Yah puts his name and you were allowed to kill it there and eat uh, your tithe, your second tithe, right? Not your first tithe. The first tithe goes to the Levites. The second tithe you're allowed to use for the feast days as food. And you can use that tithe. And, but you have to do it where Yah puts his name. And really in America, we, we don't have a place where Yah puts his name. So I say that Yah puts his name at any gathering where two or more are gathered. There he is. Um, it's We want to try to keep the commandments as best we can. So we take our second tithe and we buy a bunch of nice uh, food. And we, uh, we share it with our brethren on Sukkot. And we do it right here in America. We're supposed to do it in Jerusalem. But, you know, it's very expensive to go over there. So we try to keep the commandments as best we can to the best of our ability. And so I think Yah gives us mercy on that. And so definitely, um, yeah. So I just want to point that out to you. So a lot of people think that blood makes you unclean. And I'm here to tell you, no, blood does not make you unclean. If you cut yourself and bleed, it's not unclean. Because uh, in the blood is the life, right? In the blood is the life. Um, and um, if you think about it, all the sacrifices they would do, they would use the blood to cleanse the altar. They use the blood to cleanse the temple, the tabernacle, in the, uh, the holy place. So uh, the blood is actually the opposite. It actually like it acts like a clean cleansing agent. Yeshua's blood cleanses us. So um, no, blood does not make you unclean. That's where the life is. Uh, usually, all the things that make you unclean uh, come from death. Now, um, I won't get into all the things that make you unclean because that was last week's. But I will add this in there. If somebody uh, is has an abnormal discharge, he is unclean. And if he spits on you, then you're unclean. <laughs> That's a weird anomaly verse. And uh, I think it's Numbers or Leviticus 15.8. I think that's right. I have to double check. Uh, Leviticus 15.8. Yeah, it is Leviticus 15.8. Okay, so, uh, all right, so let's just read Matthew 15, verse 8. These, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. The teachings are merely human rules, traditions of men, basically. 
So yeah, birthdays are traditions of men. They're not biblical. They're not scriptural. Only kings would do uh, birthdays. And um, both times are mentioned in the Bible. The three times they're mentioned in the Bible, it's re related to a death. Um, so Pharaoh had a birthday party, and I think the uh, either the cupbearer or the baker got killed. I can't remember off the top of my head, but one of them did. Uh, John the Baptist died on a birthday. King Herod's, um, I think it was his sister-in-law's, uh, soon, yeah. And then also, um, what was it? Oh, Job's. Job's sons were all having birthdays, and they all died. So, uh, not a good idea to do birthdays. It's just a tradition of man. And then the whole Christmas thing uh, is December 25th. We all know it's tied to uh, paganism. It's a week of lawlessness that the Romans would do. You could commit murder and not be punished for it. It was seven days of lawlessness that started on December 25th. And so, this has nothing to do with Yeshua's birthday. Again, nobody in scripture, there's no verse here. Moses came down from Mount Sinai and everybody had gathered together and they had a surprise birthday for him and he was overjoyed. No, there's no scripture anywhere that says that they did birthdays. So um, birthdays are celebrating yourself. We're not to do that. That's pride. We're supposed to celebrate Yahweh. This is what we are. Our whole design and function is outward to give glory and love to Yahweh and give glory and Yah to other people, not to ourselves, right? We're outward beings, serving others, and so serving Yahweh. So we don't want to be having a set-apart day just for ourselves or our child as well. It's, I mean, it's a nice thing, but it's definitely of the world. Just wanted to point that out. Christmas. Um, I won't get into all that, but anyway. Uh, why is, why does this scroll, this is in Ezekiel, I think, yeah, Ezekiel, uh, anyways, Ezekiel 22, um, okay, so what, what was one of the reasons why Babylon was taken over? Well, several, several reasons why Babylon was, I'm mean, sorry, not Babylon. Oh man, this is funny. <laughs> what were the reasons why uh, the southern kingdom of Judah taken over by Babylon? Well, there were several reasons, right? There's several reasons, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. Uh, before I do that, I'm gonna go uh, clarify some things. For, for the baker was the one who was killed. I just want to make sure I'm accurate here. The baker was the one that was killed, uh, and then not the cupbearer, and the other uh, Salome was the uh, woman who had who wanted to have john the baptist killed she was the da daughter of herodias the stepdaughter of herod antipas antipas so um who was the ruler at the time so he was the stepdaughter she was the stepdaughter and so there you have it there you have it so let's go back to the shemitah the shemitah uh, year so um so the reason why, um, the reason why the the southern kingdom of Judah was overtaken was because because uh, they weren't helping the less fortunate. They were actually oppressing the less fortunate. This is like a double sin. They're being cruel to the widows, orphans, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, the foreigners. They were not keeping the land sabbaths. Uh, they were killing babies and sacrificing them to Moloch which was worse than Israel. Israel never did that. And they were doing divination and idolatry. So uh, these are the reasons why uh, the they were overtaken. And so they weren't doing the land Sabbaths. And so this goes back to the seventh year Shemitah. Um, I believe that we should be doing this uh, seventh year land rest. We should be doing it. It's uh, a year that uh, you would forgive all debts. Um, you wouldn't plant or, or harvest or seed. You wouldn't do any farming whatsoever. Um, so you'd basically have the year off and uh, if you're a farmer and you also would not, you would let any Hebrew slaves go, you would forget all debts and um, let's see. it would be a bumper crop for you that year 
And so uh, you wouldn't have to work the whole year and you would take it off and you just spend time with Yahweh and, and doing more holy things and being more Kodesh and being set apart to Yahweh and uh, just trying to do the right thing. And um, what what a great almighty. It was kind of like living in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Jewish tradition says you would go to your neighbor's yard. You could pick off there. You know, if they had corn, you could go pick corn. If, if you had pomegranates, they would go eat pomegranates off your yard and, and Yah would give you a bumper crop so there'd be all kind of food everywhere nobody would be hurting for food it was not a famine year it was a bumper year bumper crop year and so everybody had food and you didn't have to work and um it was just like was in the garden of eden it was basically you just eat what you, you saw and it was a rest he, he would give you a rest just like there's six days you work and then the seventh day you would rest it's six six years you would work and the seventh year you would rest and he would give you a seven. And we, I mean, people work 30 years without ever taking a year off. I mean, that's just, we're not designed to do that. Alan. The Shemitah is a year of rest, not just for the land, but for the people. And, and, and to spend more time with Yahweh, spend more time with your family, and uh, just be a more enjoyable um, thing to do. And I, I believe we should do it wherever you live. Um, and so it should definitely be done. There was a pastor that did it, and she could, for grave. She forgave her sister four thousand dollars that he owed, she owed her, and and when she did that, she had a renewed relationship with her sister, and they had, they they were there. It's like, uh, and she goes, "This I knew I should have done this. This is I should, this this is proof that the shemitah works because now we are, are better friends. Now we're not mad at each other anymore, and so she's got. I'm going to do it every 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 seven years, and then in the mail she got uh, two weeks later she got in the mail. A check or, or a forgiveness from her second mortgage they forgave her forty nine thousand dollars and she didn't have to pay the forty nine thousand dollars and forty nine thousand dollars is seven times seven Shemitah and so she forgave her sister and then she was forgiven from the bank and so she knew that she should be keeping the Shemitah and Jubilee and she lived it here in America so uh, I believe that definitely we should be doing the Shemitah um, it's my personal opinion based on Scripture and um, I, I have a friend who was definitely blessed for keeping the Shemitah. And he didn't have to work all year. And uh, he was able to do more ministry and more holy things. And, and, uh, it, and it worked out really good for him. So, uh, yeah. I think we should try to keep the, best, the commandments as best we can to the best of our ability. Definitely so. And, uh, and I had one friend who uh, tried to stock up on food. So he wouldn't buy anything fresh. He would have a bunch of stored food. And I think he went three or four months. And then he said, I, I really had to buy food because I, I ran out of money and I ran out of, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't store everything. So he tried his best to keep the Shemitah and just eat old food. But it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, we're in Babylon, so we got to keep the, we got to keep it the best way we can. Okay, so what about this eating of the scroll in Ezekiel? The eating of the scroll is possibly... Um, what does it do? It possibly cleanses the mouth of all the sins that come from the mouth and also filling, it's also a feeling of prophetic words from Yah for prophesying. And so this spiritual event of anointing the person with the ability to be a prophet. So when in Ezekiel, he's eating this scroll or this coal, and I believe that it's cleansing him and it's... Uh, it's allowing him to be a prophet because how many sins come out of the mouth? So many sins come out of the mouth. It's and uh, so he's cleansing his unclean mouth and and uh, and so why does his stomach become bitter? So why does this? And so I believe the scroll or coal that he eats sucks up all the sins and cleanses the 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 prophet so he uh, becomes holy a holy vessel of honor and used for kodesh purposes right so everything that comes from yahweh is holy and kodesh everything so this coal is coming from yahweh is super holy and so he consumes it and uh, uh it is holy and then it comes becomes bitter in his stomach because it's a sucking up all the sins and taking it out of him i believe and uh, so it's just a theory based on scripture. I, I kind of like this. Um, okay, so I just got one more thing. Is it possible not to sin? Uh, my answer to that is um, no. Yahweh is looking for, he's looking for, he's not looking for perfection. He's looking for overcomers. He's looking for people 
that are growing and going overcoming their sins. That's what he's looking for. Uh, but he does want us eventually to be perfect or close to perfect, right? And how do we do that? And, and there in some scripture that indicates that we can be sin free. Um, but I, I think there's a caveat to that. And I'm going to kind of explain that. So First John 3, 5 says, Now that he was revealed to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever remains in him does not sin. So there you go. Whoever remains in him does not sin. So it is possible not to sin. And um, it says in 1 John 3, 7, He who does righteousness is righteous even is as he is righteous. So as we do more righteous things, we, be, we become righteous, right? The more righteous things that we do and make it a habit, it's just going to be second nature and we become righteous, right? So this is what it's saying. So always try to do righteousness all the time. Force yourself. And then it will become a habit. We are stuck in our old ways, which is unrighteousness, right? We do these old habits. We need to change those old habits into righteousness, right? Whatever is righteous and good. And, and then all of a sudden, guess what? It becomes a habit and then you are righteous. It says so right here in 1 John 3, 7. He who does righteousness is righteous. So praise Yah. So this is super powerful. Whoever remains in Yeshua does not sin. This is powerful. So who, who, who... Whoever does not, who, who remains in him. And um, so the answer is right here, basically. And so uh, how do we remain in him? How do we remain in him? And I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, it says right here. Whoever is born of Yah does not commit sin because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of Yah. So when we get baptized, we're basically born of Yah, right? We have a seed of the Holy Spirit, and that comes from Yahweh. And so uh, we are born of Him. So we, we cannot sin, but we need to let the Holy Spirit lead us. See, so, so when we let the Holy Spirit lead us, right, when we get a seed of the Holy Spirit, we have to submit to the Holy Spirit. So uh, a lot of times you'll have a thought in your head to do something really nice, right? Well, that's not you. That's the Holy Spirit, right? So don't quench that thought and go and do that thing that the Holy Spirit is directing you to do. The Holy Spirit's going to go, um, go get flowers for your mom. And you're like, oh, well, that's my thought. I, I don't want to do that. I don't have time for that right now. No, you need to let the Spirit lead you. Go get flowers for your mom. That's right. So this is this is the Holy Spirit. So those who are led by the Holy Spirit are the sons of the Almighty. We don't want to be the son of man. We want to be the sons of the Almighty. Right? The sons of Elohim. So we have to let the Spirit lead us. And this is how we're born of Yah. So let me read it again. 1 John 3, 9. Whoever is born of Yah does not commit sin because his seed remains in him and he can't sin because he is born of Yah. And what does Yah give you when you're born, when you're baptized and you're reborn with the Holy Spirit? He gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you a seed of the Holy Spirit. And so um, it says right here, the seed, right? The seed remains in him. So we get this seed. We got to now uh, submit to the Holy Spirit's authority. Those who are led by the Holy Spirit are the sons of the Almighty. So this is how you don't sin. Now, what happens is some people get stuck in their old ways and they submit to their flesh. They're no longer submitting to the Holy Spirit of Yahweh. And then they go into sin. So you need to stop that and let the Spirit lead you. So you need to submit to the Holy Spirit and pray for that. Pray to the, that the Holy Spirit will lead you. Okay. And then, so here's the next thing. Um, he, uh, okay, so let me read it again here. Uh, it says, whoever remains in him does not sin. 1 John 3, 6. Whoever remains in him. So how do we, and he's talking about Yeshua, of course, right? So 1 John three twenty four tells us how to remain in him. He who keeps his commandments remains in him and in him and in him. By this we know that we remain in us by the spirit which he gave us. Okay, there it again, the Holy Spirit. We have to let the Holy Spirit lead us. Okay, that's how we remain in Him, and that's how we cannot sin. We know if we study the Bible and we know the commandments, then we know not to break them. To be, but the majority of people never have read their Bible all the way through. So if you don't know the rules, how are you going to follow the rules and, 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 and pass the test, right? It's kind of like if you wanted to play cricket and you don't know the rules, you're probably going to lose. It's the same thing with eternal life. So it's super important that you read your Bible so you know the rules so you can pass the test and keep the commandments and... Um, 
what's basically being said here is we need to submit to Yeshua's authority, right? He's the head of the church. He's the head of the body. We submit to his authority and do what he tells us to do, right? Whatever he tells us to do, we do. And so this is how we become, we submit to our own authority and we submit to Yahweh, his Holy Spirit. So these are the two ways you cannot sin. You submit your will to, to, to Yeshua's will and Yahweh's will, right? And to their authority and do what they want you to do and let them abide in you and let them lead you and let them pray for that to happen. And also pray to be led by the Holy Spirit. Don't try to be uh, led by your flesh. So once you do these three things, you're being led by the Spirit. You're, you're letting Yeshua be your authority. You're letting Yahweh be your authority. And you're letting them control you. Then this is how you can't sin. And you're keeping the commandments. So you, you've got to give up yourself. You've got to die to self. That's really what they're saying here. And you will be successful beyond belief. Pray for Yah to help you overcome, and you will you will be successful. Nobody's going to be perfect, but you will be you will persevere, and you will make great strides. So, um, yes, you can be somewhat sin free if you do these three things, and you just can't let your flesh get in the way. You can't uh, push Yeshua out of you and be your own authority right it says here whoever remains in him does not sin so you got to remain in him you can't push him you can't walk out of him or you know what i mean he abides in you and you abide in him so you got to remain in him and, and, and don't try to be your own boss and try to make your own rules and try to do your own thing you got to submit to your king and let him rule you and so this is how you can be very successful and not sinning Okay, and I also wanted to, I don't think I covered this. Uh, let me just uh, check it real quick here. I already did. Okay, so I just want to uh, thank you all for listening. I hope this uh, uh, encourages you to be more holy, to be more set apart, to seek your uh, Almighty uh, in heaven. And I pray that uh, Yahweh will help us to uh, submit to uh, the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit lead us, Father. And direct us, let our flesh submit to your spirit, Father. We ask that you, we submit to, I pray that we can submit to Yeshua's authority and let him be the leader of our life and to direct us and guide us and lead us where we need to go. And Yahweh, of course, you um, be our, our guide, our, our leader. We submit to your authority. First and foremost, Father, you are the king of the universe. Your son is the king of the earth. And we submit to both of your authority. We want you to lead us, guide us, and direct us, Father. And uh, let us not make any mistakes, Father. Let us be the pure and holy vessels of honor. And so that we can be a light to the world. Help us to keep the commandments, Father. And help us to bear the fruits of the Spirit, even under pressure, stress, and harsh circumstances. We thank you and praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen.